I have been a man who has never believed in anything strange. Not in ghosts or legends, just as a man who rarely dreams at night. Perhaps my true dreams are too concrete, too rooted in reality and material things. This has made me a difficult person to persuade, and at times, I could say that I find it somewhat challenging to enjoy some aspects of life. Until one day I was haunted by all those spirits that wander within our subconscious. At least, that's how I wanted to understand it. But it seemed to be something deeper and more ethereal than a jumble in my head. Something that I couldn't shake from my mind for weeks. Something I couldn't even control with my own will. It was just there, appearing in every time I closed my eyes, even without being asleep. Perhaps we have all dreamed of unknown people, men and women we don't remember seeing, but who interact with us during the night. Some just pass by like extras in a movie, while others present themselves as a friend, our mother, or our children. All those people actually exist, and we have seen them at some point in our lives. Probably on television, in a bar, on the street, or in photos on social media, but in one way or another, we have come into contact with their faces. This phenomenon is more common than we might think, and highlights how powerful our brain is, and how powerful it is at remembering trivial details that would seem irrelevant to our daily lives. But there are some things that go beyond what our minds can create, things that appear without us ever noticing them or knowing about them. I want to document in this recording what I have been dreaming about in these past nights. The psychiatrist has advised me to take note of each of them when I wake up in the middle of the night. I'm a bit lazy for that, so I decided to buy a relatively cheap audio recorder and describe each of my dreams. This way, I can transcribe them on some weekend with more calm and try to look for any common patterns. I hope this device doesn't break too quickly. For now, it's just time to go to sleep and see what happens. This is my first dream record. It's almost five in the morning. I've seen the face of this man again. He's in front of me and doesn't take his eyes off me. I see silhouettes of people passing behind him. Some seem to turn around to look at him. There are moments when the man disappears, and I appear in a house similar to those in my city, North Battleford. There, time seems to stand still. I don't know how I know it, but in the dream, I am absolutely certain that I have been stuck for an eternity in a night that never ends. As often happens in one of the hallways of the house, the man reappears in the background, and he stares at me. He approaches, and with each step, the house begins to burn, and I wake up. I have dreamt again of the man who watches me attentively. There is something in his appearance or presence that suggests a name to me. Robert Barzy. That name resonates in my mind every time I see his face. This time the dream doesn't take place in any location I can identify. There are metal bars in the sky, transforming into stars, and the ground is swampy at times. Yet simultaneously, I walk on neat, ochre-colored ceramics. This dream has been brief, but the name Robert Barzy continues to resonate with me.
I woke up half an hour before my alarm. Today I have to pick up my niece from the scouts. I needed that half hour of sleep. I swear, I know I forgot to record my dreams for the past few days, but they've been vague, harder to describe each time, and honestly it seems like I don't remember them as well as before. I'd like to think these dreams will end, and that man, Robert Barzi, is nothing more than an expression of my subconscious trying to tell me to relax a bit, work less, or whatever. I'll discuss that with my psychiatrist next month. I have nothing more to say this morning. I just woke up and I'm sweating. I'm really sweating badly. I think I have fever. But the heat I'm experiencing is unbearable. I saw Robert Barzi once again. His face. I've never had him so close to me. He just looked at me. And everything around him was on fire. And it felt so real. I know I must have caught some kind of flu, and that made me have that nightmare. But I can't stop thinking that this man has reappeared so vividly in my dreams. I'll comment more at some other time. It was indeed the flu, but fortunately, I have almost no symptoms. It was tough, and that's why I didn't record more until tonight. Since April 9 or 10, I don't remember the date exactly, I have continued to dream about Robert Barzi every damn night. Sometimes he appears as just another person, an extra in my dreams. Although I sense his presence and his penetrating gaze. Lately, my dreams have been set in old neighborhoods, those where houses are still only made of raw brick, with a reddish tone that I have never seen in this neighborhood, but have seen on TV and in some movies. I also took the opportunity to draw this man's face. I know I'm not very good at this, but I've tried to do the best I can. It's terrifying, I know, and I don't like looking at it too much, but... This situation is starting to disturb me a lot, so I have asked the psychiatrist to move up my appointment. Remember to listen to this recording tomorrow. It's scheduled for April 25 at 3 in the afternoon. Note it down. Over the next two months, Dreams of that man diminished considerably in intensity. For a whole week, I didn't even dream of him. It was a great relief for me and for the development of my personal life. It seemed curious because I didn't really know what I had done to stop having that dream. In fact, the psychiatrist didn't prescribe any pills. For him, it was just stress. However, my tranquility wouldn't last long and it was the situation I will detail next that encouraged me to document all this and transcribe the recordings about my dreams. On the morning of Sunday, July 11th, I received, as usual, the newspaper at my doorstep. It contained the usual. Economic crises, sports results, interviews with politicians, some celebrity uttering an unfortunate and irrelevant phrase. But in the corner of page 14, the following was announced. Fatal fire leaves at least four victims and one missing in the city of Saskatoon. Alex, aged 32, had been one of the victims, along with his children, Jeremy, Tim, and Kristen. The man who couldn't be found was named Robert Barzi. Something seemed to click in my head. Suddenly, everything seemed too obvious. The name, the fire, and his face. Robert Barzi's photograph had been published in the newspaper. 
The same face I had been dreaming of for months. The note, quite brief for the seriousness of the matter, stated that the family's father had disappeared after the fire. No one had heard from him again, neither relatives nor friends. Not even the neighbors who had declared that it wasn't the first time they had witnessed other fires in the neighborhood, where other people had also been declared missing. Robert Barzi was a real person. All this time I had been dreaming of someone who actually existed. But where had I seen him before? He didn't seem familiar at all before he started appearing in my dreams. The news indicated that the incident had occurred in Saskatoon, a city I had never been anywhere near. Everything was too strange and confusing, and things didn't stop taking on an ominous tone. I didn't dream of that man again since then, and I didn't dream of anything else. My nights were short, and I couldn't fully recover. It felt like closing my eyes, and after a few seconds, I woke up, as if I hadn't slept even for a moment. I went back to my psychiatrist and told him what had happened. I expected a more empathetic reaction from him, but he just responded with a mocking snort and told me I was worrying too much. He advised me to stop reading so much news, to stop watching television as well. Men like this, Robert Barzi, are everywhere, he insisted. It was a common face, and everything had been a simple coincidence. I needed more rest. Stress was still playing tricks on me. At this point, what I would call a necessary turning point for the story occurred. The psychiatrist decided it was a good idea to medicate me, so I could sleep better and stay less alert during the day. But I refused. I couldn't take medication under the premise that my story with Robert Barzi was a lie. Conjectures of a paranoid mind that had started to link random events due to emotional overload. It was then that I headed to Saskatoon with one mission. To find those neighbors of Robert Barcy and his family. To gather all the information I could about him. My journey to the city wasn't too long. Sometimes I wonder why I never felt the need to come to this place before. It's less than two hours from my hometown, North Battleford. Naturally, I was surprised by the expanse of its streets and avenues, but I've always been good at navigating maps, so finding Robert Barzi's house was easier than I thought, especially pinpointing it in the neighborhood as it was the only one that differed radically in aesthetics from those around it. Made of reddish bricks, massive, and victim of a fire, not many days ago. It was already July 18th, and the possible debris left by the fire and rescue procedures had been cleared. Only the massive structure remained, along with a couple of trees in the backyard that strangely didn't suffer the consequences of the fire's ferocity. The house had that ominous look not necessarily because of the fire's aftermath. Something about it gave it a strange appearance, alien to the neighborhood. Darker than the rest of the houses, with the garden somewhat neglected, obviously before the tragedy. I made sure no one was watching me from nearby windows and entered the porch of Robert Barcy's house. The air still felt difficult to breathe just by approaching the entrance, and the disaster was evident. Nothing had survived inside. All that remained were ashes and charred marks on the walls. The beams of light crossing into the interior suggested that, perhaps, Robert Barzi had been more consumed by the house itself than disappeared. It didn't take long before an elderly lady asked me from the fence of the adjacent house if I needed anything. The woman, with a friendly tone but a frightened face, wanted to know what I was doing there. So interested in the house and taking photographs. I replied in the same cordial tone that I had read about the fire in the newspaper and that I was interested in what had happened. 
She mentioned that I wasn't the first to come, that strangely a lot of people seemed to have taken an interest in the incident, that they had simply gotten out of their cars, taken photos from the outside, and left without further ado. The woman seemed willing to answer all kinds of questions, and I was surprised to discover that she was the neighbor who had spoken to the press about the history of fires in the area. To protect her identity, I'll call her Rose. I hesitated to tell her about my dreams with Robert Barcy. I assumed she would think I was crazy and immediately distrust me. Could I be some kind of deranged man who has become obsessed with macabre stories? While it seemed plausible, I was also becoming somewhat paranoid about the matter and what others might think of me. However, I noticed that Rose was open enough to talk about the history of Robert Barzi's house, justifying my visit with the true reason. So, I was clear and direct. The Barzi family were acquaintances of my sister, and that was precisely why I had made the trip. I needed to verify if it was indeed them. What you will hear next is Rose's account, who kindly agreed to tell me the story of her neighbor's house. At times you'll notice she thinks I'm some kind of journalist or government agent. Perhaps she even ignored the reasons I mentioned for being there talking to her at some point. The history of this neighborhood is very long. My late husband and I moved here when they were just starting to build the first houses. It might seem curious, but this site was also ravaged by a fire in the early 1900s. There was a steel plant, as I was told, many years ago when we bought this house. I have some old documents if you're interested. The fire was so fierce that the land being so damaged was sold at a much lower price. So real estate developers took the opportunity. However, one of the few buildings that survived the steel plant fire was. And this seems quite strange, let me tell you. It was the Barzi family's house. The one that, over a hundred years ago, supposedly housed the office where the company owner worked. I think all this must have been some family dispute because the only heirs of the steel plant were the ones who stayed to live here in the same house. They renovated the burn building, and when we arrived, we were their neighbors for a while. Perhaps this is the strangest thing you'll hear, and what I'm going to tell you will be followed by other information that will be equally or more shocking, if you permit me. Our first neighbor was also named Robert Barzi who lived from the 40s to the 60s with his family until a fire swept away everything they had built. Just like what happened to our Robert Barzi, who disappeared a few days ago. I am sure they were relatives, and as such, they have lived on this inherited land for decades. The name thing may have a plausible explanation. Look, I am named after my grandmother, and my late husband carried the name of his father and grandfather, naming children. In honor of their ancestors is a fairly common tradition, but it's still curious. I'll leave it to your interpretation. Rose was too kind to me. After the story she told me, she headed to her room, rummaging through some boxes, she pulled out several folders filled with newspaper clippings, organized by year and carefully classified. It was then that she handed me the local newspaper report from October 7, 1966. The day after the first fire in the Barzi family's house, the first of them. There, a very brief report also recorded the death of five people and the disappearance of one of them. Above the headline, a photograph of the house engulfed in flames and the portrait of Robert Barzi also missing.
But none of this answered my real question. What had brought me to this place two hours from my home? Why had I been dreaming of that man? What was in him that was so relevant in my life? I don't know if I should consider the strangeness of his story, but these coincidences were steeped in a mystery that gnawed at my thoughts. I couldn't just sit idly by, so I began my journey back to my beloved North Battleford, and thus began my investigation into the Barzi family, from the missing to the first victim of the strange fires. The early years of the 20th century saw the burgeoning city of Saskatoon, still with no more than 5,000 residents, witness the burgeoning of the steel industry, taking its first major steps in establishing large-scale production in the lonely and sparsely populated lands of the province of Saskatchewan. It was in the year 1895 that Amadeo Bursi, heir to vast agricultural lands from his family originating in northern Italy, decided to venture into a completely different field and give a notable boost to the province. In just a few years, he managed to establish Canada's most important metal processing industry. In 1902, he entered into his third marriage with the only daughter of the region's largest railway services entrepreneur, Raymond Le Puchichot who was 30 years his junior. Together, they had two daughters, Alice and Michelle. With the aim of creating a distinctly Western Canadian brand, Mr. Bursey decided to anglicize his name, and thus his family and business would adopt the surname Bursey. This is the earliest record found in North American territory of the curious surname that repeated itself for two generations among families unrelated to each other. Amadeo Barzi amassed a colossal fortune for the time, and although money was not a matter of concern in terms of his lifestyle, he chose to live in the same house until the day of his disappearance. Regarding the mystery surrounding his death, some news from cities near Saskatoon reported a massive fire that raised the entire steel complex, including his house. Similarly, but with a few extra details, local newspapers reported. However, the information in general is somewhat vague, and there are only documents related to the life of the Barzi family through what we might call biographical sources. In this category is the medical note of one Joseph Noble, an Austrian psychiatrist residing in Vancouver who was called by the Lepici Show family to evaluate their daughter's strange behavior a few years after marrying Amadeo Barsi. In this psychiatric report, which is housed in the Museum of the Canadian Psychoanalytic Society in Montreal, the following is recorded. Mrs. Barsi, formerly Lepici Show, has an ectomorphic build and presents good features, physically healthy, good psychomotor performance, and correct spatial orientation. She has been visited by me at the request of her father, who entrusted me with monitoring her for at least two nights at the family estate. Likewise, her father has expressly requested that neither this report nor my examinations be disclosed to Mrs. Barsi's husband. The reasons remain confidential on the family's part. Mrs. Raymond responds to my questioning by stating that she experiences significant discomfort that only occurs in certain areas inside her marital home. Additionally, she mentioned feeling intense heat in the palms of her hands whenever she performed tasks near the door leading to the basement. The latter is relevant because she emphasized the matter of that door on several occasions and how the doorknob seemed to be burning at various times of the day especially during the mornings. She has also suffered from constant nightmares regarding this and a word that she describes as terrifying to even mention. Karoi. The family is extremely concerned about their daughter's unfounded accusations against her husband, as she has repeatedly mentioned that it is Amadeo who has an unhealthy connection to the basement of the house, and that there is something beneath it 
causing those inexplicably high temperatures. Mrs. Barzi's family has suggested that their daughter may be suffering from severe hallucinations, if not demonic possession. They also demand that my treatments help her maintain her sanity and respect her husband. It will all be for the sake of their daughters. My impressions, on the contrary, differ somewhat, as I observe a personality atrophy due to traumatic neurosis regarding the birth of her two daughters, as well as the change of scenery to the new city. The city is filled with foul odors, possibly toxic smoke, and a distance from her siblings and mother. Based on the above, I can diagnose with certainty that my science attributes a traumatic somatization hysteria. For this reason, she will be recommended to take hot baths twice a day, as well as prescribed infusions detailed in the annex of this report and sessions every two days of visual deprivation so that her visual system can learn to recognize the world again. Regarding the basement activities, I've been informed that Mr. Amadeo Barzi is the owner of the steel factory. So given such prestige, I fear these are matters to which I will be ethically obliged to avoid commenting on. It is understandable that Given the error and professional considerations, what the young Raymond Barzi experienced was treated as more than just a case of hysteria, as evidenced by letters between partners and friends of Amadeo Barzi, which could be classified as valid testimony in the most literal sense. That is to say, there was something there in the basement and in the home itself that elicited physiological reactions in the woman. For the last existing record from 1908, the week before Amadeo's death, concerning the attendance report from the factory central office, indicates a five-day absence from work by the owner. Observations reveal a subsequent note indicating that Mr. Barzi remained at his residence, specifically in the basement, as attested by the housekeeper and his wife. Since then, the story is well known. The fierce fire claimed the family, except for Amadeo Barzi, who was never found alive or dead. Years later, due to the decline of the company, the factory facilities were abandoned and slowly purchased by real estate agencies. This deeply caught the attention of some locals who, thanks to new access to technology, documented the desolate abandoned landscapes. The most iconic photograph stands out, showing a strange spectral figure in a windows of Amadeo Barsi's peculiar house. It is curious that there is such scant information beyond birth records about the family of the first Robert Barsi, who died in 1966 although it is also logical to consider that these were ordinary citizens, middle class, with no significant academic or professional achievements. The same happened with the case I happened to read about in the newspaper a few weeks ago. I couldn't gather more information than what I obtained from Rose, which was quite insufficient. But I'm not sure if that would have helped much because the information I was seeking wasn't really found in the history of their lives, but in the house itself. The exact location where there was still a basement, the same one where Raymond had experienced such strange events and where Amadeo Barzi had secluded himself until the fire, only to disappear without a trace. Days after my encounter with Rose, I decided to return to the house. Fortunately, it was still standing just as it was on that occasion. The interior still had that strange haze, similar to suspended smoke. However, with the number of days that had passed and the excellent ventilation the house had achieved after doors and windows were completely consumed, it felt unnatural. Similarly, and keeping in mind Raymond Barsi's words, there was a strange oppressive heat felt inside, 
as if it were some kind of heat emanating from the house's foundations. Navigating the interior, it didn't take long to find the only staircase that, due to its construction materials, had not been affected, unlike those on the upper floors which were reduced to ashes. It was the path to the basement, from where I can assure you I felt the flow of a warm breeze emerging, which at the time I did not perceive how harmful it was. Always with a sensation of burning and heat in my hands and cheeks, I decided to descend and explore the place in search of something that would give me some clue to what I was trying to discover, the origin of my strange dreams. Everything seemed normal for what had happened. The fire had swept away everything existing under the house. Many areas were unrecognizable compared to what one might assume prior to the tragedy. There, accompanied only by a flashlight and the light of my camera, I found nothing strange or unexpected until I reviewed the photographs at home. At that moment, I realized a couple of images of things that perhaps I did not see due to the excessive darkness and not because they were not really there. For those claws protruding from the basement are clear enough to actually be there. Once I came to terms with what I was seeing, beyond fear or excitement, I also noticed that my arms had reddened to such an extent that I had to go to the hospital to be checked, as over the days the burning sensation increased considerably and they already looked like something serious to be treated. The doctors there asked me if I had been exposed to high temperatures, to some kind of oven, or something similar, to which I responded negatively, mentioning that the closest thing was my visit to Robert Barcy's house, but for the specialists, this had no relation whatsoever. After all, in a fire, the heat emanating from objects does not reach such intensity as to harm a person, especially after so many days. This is how I came to the conclusion that this must be the result of something unknown, something otherworldly perhaps, and then I remembered a word that would ultimately be the answer to this, Karoy. The word that Raymond Barzi constantly found in her nightmares. You may be surprised or not, but a few years ago the renowned television network History Channel made a brief documentary about the followers of a strange demon of the same name. A demon that has been present in various moments of history and has had a characteristic in its actions that has led to the ruin of anyone who has believed in it. The obsession with its figure. Throughout history, man has endeavored to give extensive and endless forms of understanding to the world that surrounds him. The strangeness of nature itself has sparked a thousand fantastical tales attempting to make sense and logic of that which seems unreachable and elusive to human understanding. From storms to deadly droughts, all civilizations since recorded history have concentrated their worldviews in mystical narratives of divine beings who, from a celestial plane or the very underworld, manipulate the threads of both the destinies of individuals and everything that surrounds them. Harvests, rains, fires, and even the miracle of life have some proximity in their initial definition to some kind of supernatural force that has placed them there for some reason. Both in the Eastern and Western worlds, religions have imposed themselves as the universal and socially accepted explanation for hundreds of generations. Millions of rituals are celebrated each year affirming this powerful institutionalization of what we know as Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, among many others. 
The faithful have turned these gatherings of devotion into true social rituals where they reaffirm and share their experiences of the most diverse natures and forms of expression. Whether it is Jesus, Allah, Muhammad, Abraham, they all share something in common, being symbolic representations of a set of values that move their followers, who project their lives according to the fundamental principles that their beliefs define as the right or the ordained for an eternal life, a life of light or wisdom. Despite the fact that humanity has often been at extreme war risk due to differences in beliefs, these seem not to cease, and their followers seem to rally more with the standards to defend their positions and principles in life. The history of humanity has countless facets, events that have conveniently been left out of the official and hegemonic narrative, which, due to their dark and little-known past, does not mean that they lacked a certain relevance or importance for an extensive group of people at a certain date. In fact, many of these events were in their time the official and duly accredited versions by emperors, kings, or figures of religious authority, but, for various reasons, many of them of a political nature, they were censored and kept away from public knowledge, burying them in the greatest of oblivion, to the point that today they seem like stories taken from conspiracy theories or documentation adulterated for sensationalist purposes. This was the case of the Holy Church of Karawa, whose influence on the Orthodox Patriarchate of Constantinople during the 6th and 7th centuries was of utmost relevance for various political decisions and diplomatic resolutions among the different rulers of the time. This church, whose foundation dates back to ancient tribes that inhabited what is now known as Turkey, began as a traditional heretical cult to the god of the caves called Karawayero, a place where a few ancient drawings have been found in the current province of Denis Lee, near the renowned Pamukkale Park. According to scarce historical records, the veneration of Karawa was one of the greatest secrets of the inhabitants of the southern and eastern region of Anatolia, who had to resist the onslaughts of various invasions and religious impositions that occurred on the bridge connecting Europe and Asia. From old books, his darkened and enormous appearance has been rescued. It is thought that these descriptions were probably intended to create a relatively terrifying story in order to persuade rival tribes or potential enemies of foreign nations. However, records close to the decline of the Roman Empire indicate something more than such an intention. Although the trace of Karawa is somewhat diffuse before the Common Era, it is during the time of Justinian the Great in the 6th century that the figure of the strange god reappears. In fact, it is said that the influence of this belief on the Roman Emperor was so great that he ordered to portray his image in the corners of the interior of one of the domes of the Hagia Sophia Cathedral, as a way of reminding the figures of Christianity of his fervent belief in what he called the one true God. Although today Hagia Sophia has been converted into a museum, after previously becoming a mosque with the Turkish invasion, and the portraits of Karawa are no longer there, there are records of historians, explorers, navigators, and political figures who have made references in their writings to the presence of this intimidating figure in the heights of Hagia Sophia. The museum's registry data indicate that around the year 1799, they were removed by explicit order of Selim III, and the persecution of the cult established as law in Mamma II in 1809, a year after the beginning of his sultanate, as a measure that is suspected to have had certain retaliatory motivations. From that date on, many works of art, both national and foreign, were declared lost or destroyed, only to be found in the mid-20th century. However, although the main center of worship seemed to be found in Ottoman lands, art historians and clerics have bet on its high level of knowledge beyond Turkish borders, 
After coming across a series of paintings that have tried to portray the relationship of men and Catholicism with Karawa. Both in the Middle Ages, with painters like Francesco della Passa, as well as with Veronio Salacci and Brehan von Haupthaus, contemporaries of Michelangelo Buonarroti, the evidence of the religious impact of this deity was revealed, despite the almost absolute ignorance of these artists, who enjoyed relative recognition in their lifetimes. But the question that arises is the following. Who or what exactly was Karawa Yarol and why did it become such a transcendent figure in antiquity? Historians have not come to an exact conclusion about whether this entity was actually seen or had direct contact, as some stories describe it as a god appearing in the dreams of clergymen and kings, as well as a collective myth that induced pseudo-hallucinations close to what was known as mass hysteria. On the other hand, this figure is described as an omnipresent being, simultaneously seen in monasteries, cathedral catacombs, royal palaces, presenting itself as epiphanies of perfection and salvation to all who saw it. Such an impact had on the ecclesiastical society that many priests tried to influence the popes, as well as political authorities with religious connections, to impose the worship of Karawa as the true messenger of God. For this reason, stories mainly tell of its appearances to figures of relevance in the spheres of power, and rarely were detailed stories of revelations to peasants or slaves known. It is to be assumed that Karawa tried to ascend in the ranks of the different churches to impose a superior truth, replacing the gospel of Jesus Christ and even changing the course of human history. A writing found in present-day Cyprus, belonging to an anonymous scribe from the 3rd century, alludes to the most faithful and detailed description ever found of this entity. Found in the manuscripts of the Revelations to Alexander Severus, dated in the year 230 of the Common Era, it presents the following account. If the divine will allow it, May my pen be the bearer of celestial grace to recount the marvel that is the creature Karoi, that he hath bestowed by the luminosity and wisdom of the Holy Spirit to the illustrious emperor Caesar Marcus Aurelius Severus Alexander Augustus in testimony of unquestionable truth. It is said that this divine entity is colossal, as vast as the columns that support the majestic palaces yet shrouded in the dark shadow of night and the darkness of coal. From its incomprehensible form rises a robust neck and a countenance of dark mantle and tone. From this being emanate reddish glows of intense incandescence, never resting in their radiance. Its language is a thunderous whisper, serpentining through every corridor and penetrating the chambers of saints and sinners just in thieves, with an unmistakable celestial voice, although its presence is ambiguously demonic. To all who hear it, no matter how brief the moment, it possesses them and is worshipped as the true God. It is said to crawl on immense walls, leaving a trace of darkness on the pristine marble. It flees through forests and caves of unfathomable depths, beyond the reach of human exploration. It annihilates hurts, leaving behind a trail of misfortune, celebrated with frenetic and enigmatic jubilation by kings and slaves alike. From its case emanates the inexplicable and mysterious divinity of the celestial plane. It is interesting to analyze the ambivalent nature of its presence, as described in what is a transcription of a story by Alexander Severus. Despite its divine, revealing, and enticing character for the entire world, Karawa harbors immense violence and disdain for society. It seems that its attempt to move within the upper echelons had the sole intention of stripping Christian figures of their worship position and establishing itself as the true God, transcending borders and religions, 
as its influence in Ottoman society in the 19th century had transformed into a matter of imperial order and security. Today, some archaeologists have insisted to the Turkish government to allow excavations and interventions both in the catacombs and in the domes of the Hagia Sophia Museum, but their efforts have been in vain, as the museum's heritage protection only allows interventions authorized by competent bodies in relation to state geological restoration and intervention processes. Whether it is possible someday to discover the mysteries behind the mosaics or not, the existing replicas in small mosques, which in the past were churches and basilicas, scattered throughout Turkey, of the original mosaics, offer a direct historical source for the study and unveiling of the mysteries of the cult of Karawa, a part of human history that lies hidden in the deepest ignorance and unfamiliarity but which could be one of the definitive keys to understanding the most horrendous wars for religious reasons that have occurred in the past. The influence of Karawa on powerful rulers of extinct empires could have defined the understanding of our Western world and the political relations between different cultures that coexist in close and complex relationships.